Originally, today's video was going to be about how the midlist is dying, but I looked at that title and I was like, you know, I'm getting tired of making these dark, depressing, doomsday, traditional publishing videos where I basically trash publishers because I am a part of and I choose to continue to be a part of traditional publishing. And I don't want to put other authors, um, excuse me? No. If anybody out there is watching this who is an aspiring author and wants to go the traditional publishing route, it's not my goal to force you off that path or to make you question all of your life decisions. So today we're gonna be positive. We're gonna talk about how we can save the midlist because yes, I genuinely think we can do it. But first I'm gonna trash publishers. Last year the Authors Guild released a paper called the Profession of Author in the 21st Century by Christine Larson, PhD, Assistant Professor of Journalism at the University of Colorado Boulder. Yes, we are getting into the weeds, you guys. Buckle up and get ready for some publishing nerdery. This paper was released, I really think it was like the end of February last year, right before all the pandemic stuff just really started to dominate the headlines. So like every other news story, major or minor, it kind of got lost in all that madness. We're gonna get a little of the drama happening here. So despite all the pandemic news, this paper did get some attention in the book and publishing world. Mostly everybody was just thrilled because of all of the hope it inspired. <laughs> Sorry, I just haven't had enough coffee yet. The reception was, as LitHub put it, grim. This is a 50 page report that really gets into some facts and statistics. And I'm going to link the PDF in the description below so you can download it and grab yourself a stiff drink and read it in all its glory. But let's go over some highlights. Lowlights? From the introduction slash overview, a quote, a shrinking number of retailers and major publishers are shifting the market into a monopsony an imbalanced market with only one or a few buyers. Advances are lower and contract terms are less favorable to authors. The introduction of eBooks and other forces have disrupted the market and driven down book prices. To cut through the clutter, authors must spend more and more of their already scarce writing time on marketing, promotion, and social media, or so publishers would have us believe. But we all know that it does no good and we're just on a sinking ship. Instagram can't save us and really we're all just- The career of full-time professional author has become endangered. Without change, the current course of publishing is likely to yield an impoverished literary world. This was supposed to be a happy video. Okay, but it can't be that dire, right? Let's actually look at the numbers. It just, it can't be that bad. In 2017, more than half, 54% of full-time authors surveyed earned less than the federal poverty threshold of $12,488 from their writing. An alarming 23% of full-time authors reported earning zero income from books in 2017. Literary authors saw a 46% drop in their book-related income in just four years from 2013 to 2017. Excuse me, I ordered an Irish coffee. Okay, now for some truly positive stuff. As with all changes, this offers some threats, yes, but also some opportunities. For instance, digital self-publishing has produced tens of thousands of new authors and books. The number of self-published books increased 40% between 2017 and 2018 alone to 1.6 million titles with ISBN numbers. That's awesome. And this should come as a surprise for no one. Self-publishing is booming and for good reason. And it also fits neatly with what's going on here like in general over the last couple of centuries, which is that the concept of author or writer has gone from artist to professional to entrepreneur. Depending on how you want to look at it, there's freedom in that, but there are also new restrictions. As it says in the report, for much of literary history, only those who already had money as well as leisure time and education could hope to publish. The 20th century created laws and practices, however, that allowed many writers to earn a living, and that's what I mean by moving from artist to professional. And as a result, an explosion of important books were published by women, by authors of color, and by others once shut out of authorship by financial need. 
But the changing economy of publishing today means that reliable income and time, the metaphorical room for writing that Virginia Woolf spoke of, are increasingly out of reach for many authors. So how can we fix this? How can we save the midlist? How can we save books? because that's really what we're talking about here. The report has answers. It says that four parties need to work together to create a more sustainable economy of writing and publishing. Party number one, publishers. Publishers should work to protect physical bookstores and to make books available and publicize them through other online channels other than Amazon. Such efforts like LitHub and Bookshop.org will require ongoing investment on part of the publishers and booksellers. Publishers should also treat authors like true partners by adopting fair contracts, using deep discount royalty reductions sparingly, fighting rampant book piracy and providing robust marketing and publicity support for authors. Yes, publishers have marketing and publicity departments and they should serve all authors not just 1%. Just in case anybody out there thinks I am exaggerating this, I would like to share with you a short email interaction I had with a publicist at Penguin Random House back in 2016. I had received an invitation to speak at the Queen's Book Festival and I reached out to my editor and she put me in touch with the publicist who I emailed. The publicist happened to be out of the office that day so I received one of those auto bounce back emails. And here it is. Thank you for your email. I'm out of the office today. For inquiries on this one particular title, please contact this publicist. For all other inquiries, please contact this assistant publicist. Now remember, this auto response email was not written with authors in mind. It was written with book event organizers and booksellers and other people that a publicist would be regularly in touch with in mind. So this publicist was directing inquiries about one single title at Penguin Random House to this one publicist and inquiries about all other books and authors to this assistant publicist. That is what I'm talking about when I say that one book, 1% 1 of books that come out in a given season get all of the attention. One book is the clear priority. That is the kind of stuff that is not going to fly according to this paper. If we are going to protect the value of books and create a sustainable publishing economy. Party number two, legislators should reconsider how monopsonies are treated under today's antitrust laws and how the laws are enforced. Lawmakers should assess the implications of a single company dominating so many aspects of a significant cultural industry. This is still pretty timely even a year later considering the whole Simon & Schuster Harper Collins acquisition and we're already on our way to the big two and eventually Amazon is just gonna like glom onto one of them and I just we're all everything's gonna be Taco Bell one day everything's gonna be Taco Bell. Party number three, authors. Authors should work together to the extent allowed under antitrust laws to assess the impact of pricing schemes like Kindle Unlimited, which accustoms readers to books being cheap or free and thus devalues authors' labor. They must also continue calling attention to unfair contract terms. For instance, many publishers have started paying royalties on net proceeds instead of the list retail price, and publishers increasingly sell books to retailers at deep discount with dramatically reduced royalties. Recently, the Authors Guild legal team has seen author royalty statements where royalties for more than half of the sales were paid at deep discount or special sales rates. This is kind of hilarious because it starts out saying, authors, here's what you can do, but really it's just all about publishers and how they're screwing everything up. I mean, yes, authors and agents, we need to be hyper aware of this kind of thing and call it out when we see it, but there's only so much power we have. There's only so much we can do. My agent is a fighter and so are the agents of many of the authors that I know, but we're all still stuck with these contract terms. And the crazy thing to me is that the publishers who work this into their contracts, this kind of deep discount stuff, the publishers who are kneecapping their authors, their authors who are the very foundation upon which their entire industry is built. I mean, long-term, aren't they just kneecapping themselves? I don't understand why the people who are at the heads of these major corporations don't understand that if you are on a sinking ship, you aren't gonna save yourself by punching holes in the floor. The fourth party. Foundations and philanthropists must realize good books don't just happen. 
Literature, like public service journalism, is a public good, a category of product that free markets fail to support. Rethinking and reframing literature and serious nonfiction as a worthy and important ca cultural cause akin to the performing or visual arts would help ensure the continuation of a robust culture of ideas. And I have to add that this is a realization not just limited to foundations and philanthropists, but also readers. Consumers. I mean, it includes me because even as I gripe about a lot of this stuff as an author, I know I can do better as a reader and consumer of books and put more thought into what I choose to buy. So this statement will come as a surprise to no one. Publishing is a winner-take-all game where a handful of best-selling authors earn outsized sums. In 2017, the top 10% of all authors in the survey earned a median of $167,500, the second highest 10% earning a median of 50 grand, and the remaining 80% of authors earned less than what most people would consider a viable income. Not all books can be bestsellers, and not all advances should be created equal at all. But boiling hot take here, seven figure advances are unnecessary and ridiculous and honestly kind of a weird flex when it's coming from a house that couldn't even afford to keep its most tenured editors employed four weeks into a pandemic. As authors' income has fallen, so is their time available for writing, and the pressure to promote online is high. Here's a great quote from Melinda Blau. When my book, Consequential Strangers, came out in 2009, I was convinced, in part because of my agents and publishers urging, that I could make it a bestseller if I just put in enough time with social media. In 2009. And it's only gotten worse. The gaslighting about social media has only gotten worse. One more really great quote from Morgan Entrickin of Grove Atlantic. Today, it's harder to publish serious midlist books at corporate imprints. A book that's going to sell eight to 10,000 copies in hardcover and maybe 1,500 digitally generates maybe $125,000. That's not enough revenue to crank up the publicity machine. Except, shouldn't the publicity machine crank up first and then the book would make more money? If I'm misunderstanding how this works, please let me know. But it seems pretty self-defeating to me to be like, oh, 98% of the books we acquire are only gonna make 100 grand if we do nothing, so let's do nothing. Okay, so I've mentioned self-publishing a few times in this video, and I don't wanna get too in it because one, this is a video primarily about traditional publishing, and two, that's just not my area of expertise and I don't wanna say anything ignorant about self-publishing, but I can see how a lot of things in this paper already would have convinced a writer who was on the fence trying to decide between one path or the other to go with self-publishing and that is a perfectly valid choice. But I think this headline kind of highlights exactly why it's an issue for all of us, no matter which route you go down. Income down for traditionally published authors up for self-published authors, but they don't earn much. It's not a path to sustainable income any more or less than traditional publishing. Yes, people are right now making a great living off of self-publishing books, but traditionally published authors out there are also making a great living. It's just a fraction of percent of authors in both cases. And while Amazon has allowed self-published authors to get their books out there, as we talked about earlier, pricing schemes and things like Kindle Unlimited really, really pressure those authors to devalue their books. The contradictions abound. Writers have more ways to publish than ever, but many find it harder to earn a living. It's often easier for agents to sell a first novel by a brand new author than a third or fourth or twelfth book by a well-reviewed writer. The large publishers no longer spread the pool of money available for advances among the many promising midlist authors, but provide massive advances to a few celebrity sure thing books and minimal advances to most others. My editor at Penguin Random House for Olive in the Backstage Ghost and Spell and Spindle was and is one of the best advocates for me and my writing that I have ever had. She really, really pushed to get support for those books and it is in no way her fault that it didn't happen. 
After both of those books were out, I wrote a proposal for another book that I hoped would fulfill my option clause with them, and she said she loved it, but she couldn't even take it to acquisitions because they were just, my sales were so low that they were not interested in publishing any more books for me. So about two years after Spell and Spindle came out, she and I met for coffee just to catch up. And she told me that within the last month, she had been in a meeting where they were discussing an IP project, um, meaning that the publisher, the team had come up with an idea for a book and they were going to try to find a writer to write it. And because of both the genre and the style they were looking for, and also because she knew I, did, I do a lot of IP work, my editor mentioned my name. Like I said, even two years later, she was still an advocate for me. But the team immediately shot it down, not even interested in having me audition because they did not want my name on that book because my name was attached to my poor sales. But I have to add that my poor sales had nothing to do with my name. It had to do with the fact that I did not have any marketing whatsoever. It's things like that where Yes, I know this is not personal. I know this is a business, but you know what? It is a dumb ass way to run a business. And it does feel personal because they chose for those two books to have poor sales by not giving them any marketing. They chose to let them sink. They chose to let me sink. Spell and Spindle was a Junior Library Guild selection. It was on the 2019 CDC Best Of list. It received a starred review from Kirkus and was considered for the Kirkus Award. And it made ALA's 2019 Notable Children's Books discussion list. And that, again, was all without any marketing. I refuse to be gaslit into believing that the poor sales on those books were my fault or because of my name. Because honestly, for a good year and a half after it, I did believe that and it rendered me unable to write my own fiction anymore. I couldn't finish a book. I kept starting projects and giving up on them. And I turned to ghostwriting and IP work or just anything that was writing someone else's idea because I didn't believe in my own anymore. So yeah, I can vouch for this. Even when an author looks out and get an editor who is a true advocate for her book, publishers would still rather acquire a new author that they will probably statistically let drown rather than putting even a tiny bit of investment into the authors that they already have on board. And my little sob story is nothing compared to how marginalized authors are treated. I got a pretty decent advance for those two books, Olive in the Backstage Ghost and Spell and Spindle. My contract, it was a two book contract and I got $25,000 per book. That's not bad for any book deal. And for middle grade, it's really pretty darn good. Middle grade tends to average lower than young adult and adult fiction in terms of advances. Know who else got $25,000 per book? N.K. Jemisin for the Broken Earth Trilogy. You know, the only author ever to win the Hugo Award three times in a row, recipient of the 2020 MacArthur Genius Grant, that N.K. Jemison. It's almost like there's just some factor at play here. Like, oh, what's it called? It's on the tip of my tongue. I think it starts with an R. Racism. Look, this is for many reasons not a fair comparison because we're talking about books written in different genres at different publishers for different age groups. But at the same time, middle grade averages lower than adult. So that to me makes it even more shocking. When Publishing Paid Me was going on last summer, that was the number that grabbed me and made me go, oh my God, how, how was her advance so low for that? phenomenal award-winning series. But as we have learned, if you are an author from a marginalized community, chances are publishers are going to minimalize your pay. And if you've got any doubts about that, please see the link in the description so you can scroll through this extensive and really devastating spreadsheet. So yes, this paper does discuss the lack of diversity in publishing and not just among authors, but like within the houses because that is where the problem really starts. When the vast majority of employees in a corporation are homogenous, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how hard they try and how much they want to do good, even when they seek out 
to publish authors from marginalized communities and let them tell their stories, they often just mess it up bad. Like, real bad. Diversity is reality. The publishing workforce should represent reality. It doesn't. That needs to change. Okay, <sighs> let's actually finally get into the more hopeful part of this video, shall we? I put up a poll last week asking you guys how you discover under the radar books, AKA midlist books. And I have to say right off the bat that I am deeply embarrassed that I did not include libraries on this list because first of all, duh. And second of all, that is literally how I find the majority of books I read. So I just, I don't know what I was thinking. I have no excuse. So the overwhelming winner of this poll was browsing bookstores online or in real life. And you know, I'm just gonna go ahead and include libraries in that because it's the same process, right? Booktube, unsurprisingly, since we are here on youtube.com, uh, got a good 27%. Um, Bookstagram and book blogs got 10% and book rec podcasts were pretty low on there. Maybe there just aren't as many of them as they thought. We do have quite a bit of other and I want to check out the comments starting with yes, Sherry, again, no idea why I didn't think of libraries. Seriously, big, 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 big oversight on my part. <laughs> so we've got <laughs> hidden gems browsing my local library, uh, Twitter has been an amazing resource for finding small presses that put out the most amazing stuff, either regular traditional books or the coolest of experimental literature. I found a press that actually printed a story told via an actual deck of cards. That's really cool. Good example of social media actually working. <laughs> Let's see. So Googling a book to find similar, similar books or comps. That's a pretty good idea. My brother book blogs like book birds. Browsing Amazon bestsellers or looking at recommended books on Amazon below books I already like. That can be useful sometimes, sure. More likely to ask a friend. We're going to start seeing a theme here, you guys. Browsing the library and Goodreads lists. My library app, BookTube, but falling down the rabbit hole in Goodreads. Kindle, right? It is cool that they do recommendations. Uh, I tend to browse the Goodreads list, Goodreads tags, browsing on Scribd. That's interesting. I don't know a whole lot about Scribd, I'll be honest. Um, visiting blogs or websites from other countries. That's really cool. And the best one, friends. Yes, that's part of the theme we're going to be discovering here. Facebook has pubs and I discovered my favorite series so far because of them. That's really cool. Goodreads, every time Tim Ferriss does a podcast, books are mentioned that end up on my reading pile. So maybe not like book rec podcast like that's specifically the theme but people mentioning books in podcasts i have definitely picked up a lot of books because a podcaster that i like just happened to mention it and i was like oh that sounded cool uh local library absolutely wattpad very good call uh i voted for browsing in bookstores but in all honesty i don't think i find or read enough books outside of lead titles Kelly, same. I am really actively going to try to fix this. <laughs> I've discovered a few hidden gems through BookBub. That's cool. I mostly take recommendations from booktubers and if I keep vibing with their suggestions, I'll add anything they say to my TBR. That's great. Bookmark that for later. We're gonna come back to that. Browsing outlet stores like Book Outlet, uh, love booktube recs, don't trust myself to browse online. <laughs> library, of course, uh, library. Yeah, again, I'm just so embarrassed, you guys. Books seem to find when I'm ready for them. Somehow they find their way into my path. It's really cute, I like that. Uh, I find that Kindle Unlimited has a lot of bang for my book with under the radar books and authors. As we discussed, self-published authors especially are, you know, Kindle Unlimited can get the word out for them at a very, very low price. Goodreads and Pinterest, word of mouth and recommendations from my author friends, Goodreads book clubs. Okay, so we've got the browsing bookstores and the library, right? And that includes browsing online. But then we can kind of lump everything else into one category. I'm talking about booktube, book talk, which we'll get to later, bookstagram, and recommendations for friends. That to me just all falls under the umbrella of word of mouth. And that is what we are going to get into next week because as you can probably tell by the title of this video, I decided to split this into two parts. This week was about the dying midlist. It was the dark depressing video I did not want to make, but here it is. Next week we are going to talk about how we can save the midlist. So make sure you're subscribed and you hit the notification bell so you know when that video goes up. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next week.